Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and leverage commonalities. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. My name is Bertine Crevacore West, and I'm delighted to be your host. I'm especially delighted today because we have a special guest, Dr. Karen Hills Pruden. Welcome to the show, Dr. Pruden. Oh, thank you for having me. This is exciting. I am delighted to have you here. Couldn't wait to have you on. And for those of us, for those of you who follow us, um, Dr. Pruden is going to be one of the speakers at the upcoming 2020 Global Fluency Summit here in Metro Atlanta on October 10th. 2020. So do follow our website, globalfluencysummit.com, for more updates and more details as to what we're doing. But now I want to tell you a bit more about Dr. Pruden. So Dr. Pruden, as as she is a self-proclaimed lifelong learner, I love that she has that and she says that and she carries that with her. And for those of you who can't see her, because right now we're, of course, on audio, um, you feel that when you see her. So I do at least. So Dr. Pruden, I'm going to tell our guest about you a bit. So to date, there's no other individual known to have the unique background of Dr. Karen Hills Pruden. She spent a decade working for the world's largest outdoor living history museum, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, where life in the 18th century, including the life of the enslaved, was interpreted. As the senior manager, human resources and diversity and inclusion, she advocated for diversity, equity and inclusion while employees interpreted a period in history where African-Americans were viewed as the property instead of citizens. So fast forward to the realities of the 21st century, Dr. Pruden serves as the president of the Virginia Beach NAACP. And in this role, she also advocates to secure political, educational, social and economic equality to eliminate race-based discrimination discrimination, and ensure the health and well-being of the city's over 450,000 citizens. She recently accepted a division director human resources position for a hospitality company where she oversees hotel resorts in 12 states. With regard to gender equality, Dr. Pruden has marched alongside hundreds of women in Virginia as a visual message to the General Assembly that the time has come to ratify the Equal Rights Act. She has spoken before the city school, the city school board against the displacement of African-American students during a new school construction. She respects and values everyone, which is why she was thrilled to offer the welcome message in the 2019 United States naturalization ceremony where 24 individuals from 16 countries became U.S. citizens. Yeah. You find that's, that's fantastic. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. As a child of immigrants, that resonates deeply with me, deeply. <laughs> So you'll find her advocating for any population where discrimination is used to deny their rights. When she's not advocating for others, Dr. Pruden has authored or co-authored five books. You heard that, everyone? Five books. And those are Why Are Candidates Abandoning Your Employment Process? And it lists, it lists feedback from job seekers about why they choose not to work for certain employers. The next is the humans behind the resources. And that's a look into why human resource professionals stay in the field and what they predict to be the future for the industry. The next book, Women Inspiring Nations, Volume 2, that notes the struggle to success stories of 25 women. Her books have been described as informative and inspiring for the readers. In 2019, she reached Amazon's number one bestseller rating for two books, Entrepreneurial Elevation, 31 Strategic Lessons and Personal Stories from Purpose-Driven Entrepreneurs, and Speaking My Truth 
50 real stories that inspire, empower, heal, and transform. With a hybrid philosophy of pro-education and pro-entrepreneurship, Dr. Pruden owns several businesses and is a lifetime learner. She's the owner of Pruden Global Business Solutions Consulting, LLC. She also is an award-winning real estate agent. To widely expose her to international views and concepts, she completed the Women's Leadership Program at Yale University, which is sought after by diverse women abroad. She is a professional doctorate in management and organizational leadership, a master's in urban affairs, human resources, and a bachelor's in political science. She's a certified diversity executive and a senior human resources certified professional. Thank you so much, Dr. Pruden, for oh, joining wow. us today. I'm like, wow, who is that you're talking about? It's something to hear it all said at the same, you know, in the same juncture. It's like, wow. Can I tell you, I love um, sharing your bio and, and the bio of our other guests with your audience, with our audience, because mm-hmm. people say the same thing all the time. And I, I love to see, because I can see your face. And so when, when I'm reading out the bios and, and sharing the bios with our audiences, the, the speakers' faces are amazed at their own accomplishments, <laughs> which I love because it means, honestly, to me, my interpretation of that is that you're about the work. Right. Oh, and absolutely. Right. So that you surprise yourself at how much you've done. That to me is, is a wonderful sign of leadership, quite honestly, because it means your eyes are on the prize. Right. Oh, thank you. Educate us. So I appreciate that. So there's there's an intentional reason that I do that. I <laughs> um, share with the audience. It, it really your work has empowered so many women and, and I dare say so many men, quite honestly. You know, so I commend you on all of it. It's fantastic. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's nice of you to say that. And so I want to just jump into our questions because today we're going to talk about um, specifically what you'd be talking about to an, to an extent at the summit. And we're going to be talking about um, your work with the veteran population. And as this uh, podcast focuses on diversity and inclusion, I I the way I learned about diversity um, was a very simplified form, right? It focused on race, nationality, and ethnicity, if those other two things, but it was usually about race and only that. And while race is a huge component in the diversity and inclusion and equity sphere, I think that there are so many other characteristics about DNI that we completely leave off the table. Mm-hmm. And so part of what, what I think is a more robust discussion on diversity and inclusion and equity is when we include, you know, all of those different components that are oftentimes left to the wayside. And that's mm-hmm. why your proposed topic for the, the summit resonated so deeply with me, uh, because while I'm not a veteran myself, I do appreciate all the sacrifices that they make. And while mm-hmm. I'm not, you know, always in support of where they're sent, I'm always in support of them. And when they come home, they need to have us as their their visual support. Their, they need for everyone that they've sacrificed so much for to understand them, to celebrate them, to elevate them. And I don't know that I see that enough with regard to diversity and inclusion. So I mm-hmm. really wanted you to be here um, to share your knowledge with us. So I already told everyone about your professional background, but do tell <laughs> us a bit about your current company, your consulting company, because I, I want to share that information with them as well. Okay. Well, my current company, again, you mentioned the name is Prudent Global Business Solutions Consulting. And actually, we um, target, we are the company for female middle managers seeking senior leadership positions. And so we do group coaching, individual coaching, um, succession planning, career counseling by industry. We also do um, interview prep. Image reconstruction, you know, we kind of audit their image and give them a couple of, um, I have a team of people that I can call on um, who can assist people with imagery um, when they're interviewing um, and teach them how to interview and how to look at things and how to look at things in the workplace from a managerial standpoint to a leadership standpoint, because a manager and a leader aren't the same. Um, And a lot of times when people are seeking senior leadership positions, they go into applying for those positions with the same mindset of a manager. And so I work with them on how to look at things in the workplace and be able to accumulate data when data is not there, how to articulate their successes by using data, how to look at long term three to five years out as opposed to what's going on today. 
because the things in the workplace that we're working on today is based on the goals of yesterday. Mm -hmm. And so when you're looking at your, your staff, you need to have a vision as a leadership about what you're going to be working on in the future. And you need the talents that are associated with the future goals. And so helping them to transition how they look at things in the workplace. And I have a, um, I have a love for women because there's still a disparity between the number of women who are in the C-suite compared to the men. Mm-hmm. You know, we are represented, but we are not represented well. And so that's why I chose to work um, with women. It is an area in diversity, just one area. Of course, gender is one area of diversity, but it's also an area that I have love for so I can use my operation and HR background to help coach them for their career planning. And so that's what Prudent Global do. And under that umbrella, I do all of that. And I do a lot of conference speaking, book writing, and a number of other things as well. Basically, most things that I'm called upon to do, if I can tie it into my mission or my vision, then I usually go ahead to do it. And since we're women are 50% of the population, then generally I can tie it into my mission some kind of way. I love it. I love it. I love it that for, there were so many gems in that, Dr. Pruden. So I, I, I love taking notes so, because it helps me get back because so many times, you know, people drop so many gems along the way and I want to pick some of those up. I love that you mentioned the differences between being a manager and being a leader, right? Because I don't know that everybody consciously thinks about that. And it's a really important skill. And so before I even jump into that, tell me what made you want to work with veterans in particular? Well, my husband is retired military, go Army. And also a couple of individuals that I've met in my career. I have one success story that I actually use, will use in my presentation in October that I fought for just to get an interview. And that made me realize that there are some hiring managers that because they may have had an unpleasant experience with someone who was ex-military sometime throughout their career, Mm -hmm. um, have made a decision that they aren't going to hire ex-military based on one encounter. Mm -hmm. Um, And so by me fighting for that applicant during that time, it was a qualified applicant. And I just happened to be, I was a HR manager at the time. And I'm like, this person is qualified and should be in a candidate pool. And the um, hiring manager has specifically said no ex-military. I mean, had actually said that no ex-military based on a bad experience that um, she'd had with a previous hire. I realized that this was wider and bigger than just my one situation that I was dealing with. And I start talking and start doing some reading on it and realized that there are quite a few people that feel that way. But based on how people feel about veterans, that's no different than people will feel about any other specific demographic. And I give you an example. If someone has a bad experience in working with someone of a particular race and they don't work with that race that often, then they may say, I don't want to work with that race anymore. Or if you are a man and you're in a male-dominated industry and you rarely work with women and you have the opportunity to work with women and for some reason you and that woman employee don't get along, then you may decide, I don't want to work with women anymore. You know, if you are someone over 40 and you work with someone who's young and for some reason you and that younger person don't get along in the workplace, you may decide, I don't want to work with anyone younger anymore. And so it is something that can happen with every demographic, but I'm passionate about anybody who is excluded for any reason other than their qualifications. But veterans, again, I'm married to a veteran. And then I had a situation that happened in my professional career where I advocated for a veteran who did very well. He eventually was a successful candidate and he ended up overseeing the whole division a decade later. And oh so he, he is the, the success story in terms of veterans. I feel like he is the success story. That's fantastic. Oh, he, but I don't, believe, I don't believe that he's an isolated incident. I believe that there are some individuals who didn't have someone to advocate for them in the screening process who never made it through. And so that's why I think it's important to educate people, you know, let's talk about, you know, put things out on the table. Let's talk about how you really feel about veterans, you know, and sometimes I turn, uh, bring out the flip chart or whatever. And I say, when you hear veterans, 
What do you think about it? It just depends on what environment I'm in. Sometimes I'll do that. And it'll be interesting, some of the things that the participants and then the session will have me write up there in terms of veterans or, or the other two populations that I'll be speaking about as well. Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. I find that to be honestly fascinating and horrifying that somebody yeah. just eliminate veterans because of one experience with someone. And, and I do say this too, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think especially with our veterans coming back home, those that have been um, deployed for, that, that have had multiple deployments, there mm-hmm. is a psychological as well as a physical toll that that takes. There's a familial toll that that takes, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. A social toll, an a- academic toll that that takes. And so I, I at one point in my own nat- naivete, assume that people would be welcoming to veterans when they came home. And, and I'm a political scientist at heart myself and, and mm-hmm. I'm grateful for that. So, so go poli sci. I share le- your love. Yes. yes. And you know, I didn't really, really learn about the Vietnam war in particular until I was much older. I'm about to go to grad school. And when I learned about it in detail, I learned that there was this huge inequity insofar as how the Vietnam vets were treated when they came home. And it Mm -hmm. seemed that people were ashamed of them. And I couldn't reconcile that with how World War II vets were treated when they came home. That was a different Mm -hmm. treatment entirely. We celebrated them. We we have iconic images of them everywhere. And yet with the Vietnam vets, um, especially after having spoken to a few of them, um, you know, decades later, of course. um, But when I did, there was a sadness that they had never been seen. And, and by being seen, I mean seen by their own American people. You know, mm-hmm. I thought to myself, there was so much complexity associated with that war. And I don't think that, um, quite honestly, unless you were there and or unless you studied political science, you're not going to know about that. And mm-hmm. I wondered, is that part of the reason why they were excluded? Because I had never understood that up until that point. But to hear that, you know, they're discriminated against that that's shocking to me because I would assume that, you know, for our soldiers, for our, our veterans that come back home, that we have something for them. I feel that we are mm-hmm. we should, right? We should have, if not something tangible, then at least a pathway, you know, to a life. And, and that's why when you were a better life, I should say even. And that's why when you were talking about the differences between being a manager and being a leader, I wondered if it's the same kind of shift, if you would, or transition that they have to go through from military life to, you know, the life of a lay person, right? And that's probably why they would need someone to help and advocate for them during that transition. Yeah, and it could also be the environmental change because the military is quite different. Respect is commanded by status, role, authority. Mm -hmm. In the civilian world, they don't care that you're the VP. If you're wrong, you're wrong, and they'll tell you that you're wrong. That doesn't happen in the military world. And so when your environment and how your environment operate is different, then there has to be some type of change or evolution in how you conduct yourself. Because now, let's say if you're a manager or a leader and you're ex-military and you're in a civilian world and in the military, you were used to giving someone an assignment and without question, they follow up on the assignment Mm -hmm. and they didn't question anything because you had the bars on your shoulders. And then in the civilian world, you give 
uh, uh, someone an assignment and they come back with 30 questions and haven't started at all. And you like, well, what, you know, what, what? So you have to, the environments are different and they operate quite differently, but they're, they still both operate on respect, except for it's the respect is achieved differently. And how that happens is in the military, your respect is achieved through the, the accumulation of your titles and your rank. Mm -hmm. And so there's no question if you're a captain, you're a captain. And because you're a captain, you will get this respect. I might not like you, but you'll get this respect. In the civilian world, you may have the title, but because of freedom of speech, open floor, you know, where people have these open door policies, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have these suggestion box and we have social media where someone can just go and go ham on you on social media. Um, <laughs> and people, people will question, people will question you. And mm -hmm. if enough people question you, your company will question you. Wow. You know, if a, if enough of the employees question you, then you're no longer viewed as an effective leader. Wow. You took me down a path, Dr. Pruden, <laughs> because <laughs> I'm, I'm just like, I didn't realize how deep that could go. And then with the added component of social media as prevalent mm -hmm. and, and honestly, sometimes as virulent as it is today. Right. So it, it can be something I've seen calm rational people descend into this social yeah. media madness. Yeah. And I'm a fan of social media to an extent, right? Everything is great. Candy's great until it's not, right? Yes. Until it yes. starts to rot, right? Yes, yes. And so I think of it as such. I'm like, okay, if I if I am in that too much, then I'm gonna get a stomach ache or my yes. teeth are gonna go bad or something, right? But yes. I, I didn't even think about what effect that would have, especially too, um, with regard to age, right? I would think because within diversity, there's diversity. So within the veteran population, mm -hmm. there's diversity of age, even mm -hmm. though they're used to a particular regimented sort of society. Yes. Um, I would think different age groups respond to just what's needed of them in the civilian world in a very different way, just from a Absolutely. generational standpoint, right? Can you tell me a bit more about that? I would agree with you that there is a difference between the generations and how they respond even in the military versus the civilian world. I don't know much about, you know, the generational interaction in the military because my husband's retired now. Um, I can tell you through um, interacting with ex-military um, in the workplace that they are uh, very similar <laughs> to <laughs> individuals who've never had a day in the military, you know, um, in terms of generational, the sense to communicate frustration in different, the sense to communicate frustration in real time, generational wise, like people give millennials a bad rap. As a matter of fact, I think this year the oldest millennial is like 39. So millennials aren't new anymore. Wow. So I, I wish people leave millennials alone. Yeah. They're, they do home with, kind of rough. they're home with children, they're married with children or whatever. <laughs> um, but the generations, I, we, the younger generations have been taught to, to advocate for wrongs verbally. Mm -hmm. It's your right to say this. It's your mm -hmm. right to say that in, in the workplace as well. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes the military does not have an outlet for it's your right. Because in most cases, it's not your right to advocate for something that's contrary to what you've been told. Wow, that is a huge shift. Yeah. yeah. And so when you come from, so when you come from a military background, you go into the civilian background and you have individuals who are advocating for what they think is their right. And their right to simply be to not check you, but to question what it is that you've given them to do as an assignment or a directive. I mean, you know, they want to discuss it. You know, they want to ask a million questions before they give it, get it done. Yeah. Um, but they, we raised that younger generation to do that. We raised them to question. I mean, that's how change happened. We would never have change in society if everybody just went along to get along. Right. Change happens when a generation of people decide, no, I don't think we like this. And they tell their friends and they tell their friends. And nowadays, you know, they, they get on social media and they start marching and different things like that. 
but we have raised the younger individuals to advocate for the wrongs, including in the workplace. In some instances, it has gotten them in trouble because now employers are writing policies about how you can advocate yourself in the workplace, and particularly on social media. But and there are a few laws also that protect employees to where they can advocate if it has something to do with uh, environment, pay, and different things like that that's covered on the National Labor Relations Board Act. So they can talk about that. But yeah, we have raised a a younger generation of people where we have taught them it's okay for them to advocate and question. Mm -hmm. And so that conflicts with the previous generation who may be your baby boomers and your generation X who we didn't have that liberty. (laughs) We didn't. As a Gen Xer myself, proud Gen Xer, I, I look at some of the millennials that I know professionally and, and personally. And I think to myself, what is happening? Because if <laughs> I had asked my mom, if I had come back to her, you know, and she was a progressive woman, but if I had questioned her to the extent that let's say I'm one of my nieces would question, you know, me, I just, I think her head would have exploded. I just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't that, imagine yeah. Right. Or you you may have seen stars. <laughs> yes, and I may have seen them up close. <laughs> so what, what is astounding to me, even with my young son, um, I tell him what, what to do insofar as like his studies, right? Because now we're in this era where, you know, parents are, are helping their children go to school online. And, you know, this was even yesterday. I said to him, all right, you need to read for 55 minutes. And he starts negotiating with me. <laughs> 40 minutes. I was, and I looked at him and I said, 55 minutes. And then he says, 35. And I'm like, you're going the wrong way. <laughs> and he thought that he had this, this kind of right yes. to do this. And he was advocating for himself. Yes. But I'm yes. advocating for your college education in the future. So yes. you know, do what I yes. Yes. And you know what? I did find while I, because I thought about that, I was like, okay, because this is a shift in, in relationships that, that we would have with our parents. And I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to give him a little bit of space where he can enjoy autonomy, right? And I only came down by five minutes. So it was like 50 minutes. And then okay. he said, okay. And he happily did it. But I just thought to myself, what was this? Should I have had an attorney present to, you know, negotiate on my behalf? <laughs> with an yeah, but you, but you often wonder that from his mindset, he was successful. He was. Because you didn't get 55 minutes. So he was, even though he only had a five minute, minute difference. Mm-hmm. And I think even in the workplace, I think that's what happens. I think in the workplace, when we have generations that advocate for change, mm-hmm. that's not happening, happening as quick as they would like for it to happen. I think if you can all come to the table and respect the fact that, okay, let, hear them out, mm-hmm. you know, and see what you can do. You know, I believe in always um, trying to to, uh, have success by getting the low hanging fruit. You know, what can we do? Because that way, whoever brought it to the table, will feel like they had a degree of success, Mm -hmm. you know. And so instead of saying no, no, no. And a lot of times that happened in the work environment because of the generational classes and clashes Mm -hmm. is that the generation who didn't have the ability to challenge, question, They'll say, no, this is what it is. This is what the policy says. Mm -hmm. Policies change. Policies change based on what's going on in the external environment that is now impacting the internal environment, which is the organization. And so if you can get some small wins out of that, then you'll have that generational happiness that's needed within the workplace. So what I'm hearing is to instead of us saying no, 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 right? And we say, what can we do? But then when we do that and we allow for some flexibility on both ends, that lends itself to what can we do together, right? And, Absolutely. We- and I value your opinion. I value your opinion. I don't just shut you down. I value what you have to say. Mm-hmm. I um, am the person that everybody comes to. It doesn't matter what their position is. You know, they could be a frontline employee or they could be a VP. People are used to people coming in my office and close the door. When I'm sitting at my desk and I look up and see them close the door, I'm like, oh, Lord, because <laughs> they close the door. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's because I listen. And sometimes listening takes a lot of time. Yes. But listening 
And in some cases, being able to explain people why now is not the right time for what they're asking for is have given me a lot of professional equity in my career, mm-hmm. you know, because um, I don't just shut them down when I take in what they're saying. And a lot of times I make notes because if, we may not be able to do it today, but we may be to do it five years from now, three years from now, whatever. So let's just like keep it active, mm-hmm. you know, to see if anything has changed environmentally so that we can make those changes. But I think you will garner a lot of professional equity and that's, and my professional equity allows me to move through the hallways of my employer and go into offices when I don't have an appointment because um, they respect me. They respect the, the, the job, the things that I've done in the past. They know that I come, have done my research. If I come in their office with some information about something um, and I have what's best for the organization in mind when I'm speaking. But I think if people listen more, but listening takes time. And a lot of time we are fast, fast, fast in the work environment, trying mm-hmm. to get things done. We don't want to take the time that's needed to build relationships and build the trust and respect that's needed that we're going to need to facilitate all of those strategic initiatives that we're trying to work on. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, and it caused it caused generational strife in the workplace as a result of simply us not having time because it comes across as being interpreted as that we don't value their opinion when it's really that you have your mind thinking about all the things that you need to do and you just feel like you don't have time but you have to I believe in making the time right and I I love what you said about professional equity I'm going to borrow that Dr. Pre- yes. <laughs> but yes, I, yes, I yes. I, w- I had someone tell me, I didn't, I hadn't thought about the term. I know what the two words mean, but um, I was trying to get in to see a VP one day and someone was like, just go up to his office. You got enough professional equity where well, he'll see you if you just go up to his office. And mm-hmm. I did and it worked. And I was like, so tell me about professional equity. And then he he explained it to me. It's when people respect you for based on your past successes Mm -hmm. um, and your knowledge, they know where you come from in terms of they know you're coming from a place of what's best for the organization. So it's never a personal tone on a relationship. You have your your agenda is what's best for the organization. And so as a result of that, you are able to navigate easily throughout your organization, regardless of titles or boundaries. I love that. And I was like, okay, well, I guess that is me because and now ever since that first day, I do, I will call like five minutes. If I, if I look on their outlook and see that they don't have a meeting, I'll call them and say, hey, you got five minutes. I really need to talk to you. And boom, I'm in there. But see, that took time to build. And I love yes. what you said about time and listening takes time. So what I take from that is that listening is an investment, right? Oh, in yes, in the yes, absolutely. I concur. Absolutely. And absolutely. I don't know that we think about it enough as such, right? And I've said this many times on this show before. Um, I am a huge fan of Judge Judy, and I know I'm dating oh, myself. I love Judge Judy. She's the best. She's the best. I watched her. Honestly, I, love her. I remember not watching her. So my whole <laughs> life, right? Yes. And what I love about her, she always has this one saying: um, "We have two ears and one mouth for a reason," right? Mm-hmm. And as we we are also professional speakers, I think that's a sign of being a great speaker, right? Is when you're a great mm-hmm. listener, right? Because mm-hmm. we have to listen to talk about. We have to listen to learn from each other, right? And I love that what you said about professional equity. Because I, I was speaking to a colleague the other day and I was talking about this, what I call the three R's. Like, I don't have a fancy term for it at all. I think mm-hmm. I have to develop one. But relationships, reach, and reputation, right? And uh, they all go together. And I, I was like- explaining to them, thank you. And I was explaining to them, you know, how the three are related to one another. Um, because your, your, your reputation is what allows you to have reach, but that's based on your relationships with other people, leveraging yes. those relationships, right? Yes, the absolutely. Moment. And, and I really said, you know, that's why that that professional equity, I love what that means because it it kind of highlights those three components yes. of time, right? Yes, I think it marries, I think exactly. I think, I think that could be one of the definitions of professional equity because it definitely 
It taught the ability to reach no matter where you are in the organization. Obviously, it's built on reputation. So, yes, absolutely. I think you can borrow that and just and twine it, marry it into your three R's. Okay, Dr. Pruden. So let's talk about political correctness. What role does that play in your work and in your industry? Because <laughs> I will well, tell you this. It has a huge impact um, because, you know, health, healthy relationships are built on trust, mutual respect, mm-hmm. mindfulness, and uh, maybe a welcoming, open and honest communication. Political correctness is the opposite of that because it causes us to mask Mm. how we really feel about a situation. So we can, Dr. Pruden, say it again. (laughs) So we can't openly discuss because we haven't articulated how we really feel. The interesting thing about political correctness in the workplace is is pretty sad because if, if employees aren't allowed an avenue to speak openly and honestly, then employers will make practices and sometimes policies based on what they think employees feel and is not how they really feel. Oh my gosh, you are definitely taking me to church with this one. You know, and yeah. so and so that's how it is the it's the bear in the workplace is because people talk about culture, culture, culture. You don't really know what your culture is if your employees cannot talk honestly and openly. They haven't had the ability to articulate to you how they really feel about the workplace culture. Mm -hmm. So as you are building these practices and these policies to increase or enhance your workplace culture, you haven't even started from an even playing field of knowing what it is that you're trying to diagnose so that you can find a cure for it. Oh you know, yes. and so that is what polit- political correctness causes employers to write the wrong prescription for the wrong disease because the symptom that they're looking at is not a symptom of what's really going on. I need to make that a soundbite, Dr. Pruden, because really, thank you for articulating it in that way, too, because I think a lot of times, um, and incorrectly so, and I used to be a person that, that thought that, that, you know, political correctness was just something assumed, that, that we assumed that HR, that that was their currency, right? And so for me, I always believe it's the enemy of cultural competence because we can't yes. be accurate, right? Yeah. But I love yeah. how you framed it in the scope of HR and creating policy, because if we can't be accurate in our terms, in our expressions of ourselves and our emotions and, and our goals and how we feel, then how can, you know, a human resources department create policy that's going to change that organizational culture of a company to help it be successful, right? Absolutely. I it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and a lot of times you will find with uh, what social media, media has revealed is that leadership will think that their culture is one thing, and then the employees will get on social media and tell how they really feel about the culture. And they clash. And you wonder, how can the leaders be so disconnected? They can be so disconnected is because there is no honest and open communication going on in any form. And I'm not saying that, you know, uh, communication has to be respectful and professional and all of that. But it can still be honest. And right. sometimes you have to provide a forum for people to be honest, you know, town halls with leadership and say, look, what's said in here, I just want to know what's going on. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. if there's not going to be any repercussions, I just need everybody to be respectful and professional in your language, no profanity, but tell me what's really going on. But a lot of times leaders don't want to put themselves in that place because at the point that they are, are that those things are known, now they have to do something about it. Oh my goodness. Yes. Just many <laughs> gems along that whole trail, Dr. Pruden. Yeah. I, I really have to say, I love the the analogy that you gave about having a town hall, right? Because I liken that to having a conference. And, and a lot of times I myself have left um, when I was, um, you know, employed with another company before I went out on my own as an entrepreneur. I remember thinking, what are these people talking about? Right? Mm-hmm. Because my entire, you know, 
row of people, you know, in that conference venue, we're looking at each other confused. Like, is this the same company? Yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. People this way, right? Yeah. And there's this huge rift between leadership and, and not even management for us, leadership and the staff, right? And it, it didn't even matter the size of the company. I, I always find that if people are not on the same page, um, people are, I think, afraid, um, and maybe with leadership too, um, what I think is they need to create this um, this sort of psychological safety. And, and um, a friend and colleague of mine, um, Dawn Christian, first mentioned psychological safety to me. And mm-hmm. I didn't understand what that was. And when she explained it in the workplace, that made perfect sense. Um, People need to be made, like you said, to feel like they can have an open and honest dialogue, right? It doesn't need to be acrimonious, but it does need to be honest. And I think people are always afraid of repercussions. And I think that's that's true for leadership as well. They're afraid of the repercussions. And one of those repercussions is hearing that maybe it's not such a great company to work for. So what yep. are you going to do, right? Yep. Repercussion is a call to action. Yeah, and now you're on notice because you've been told. So now you can't say that you don't know Mr. or Mrs. Leader mm-hmm. because now you know. So now you can't just close your ears to it. Right. You have to address it, you know, because now you are a representative of the company, particularly leadership. Mm-hmm. So it's your job when you hear this to address it. You know, I'm going to turn that back, circle it back to how we are with veterans. Right. Because I think that directly is, you know, there's a direct correlation. So I think that because people are discriminatory, discriminatory against them or their discriminatory practices with hiring veterans in some cases, Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. this happens with creating an open and honest dialogue. Right. But not only talking to the staff about, well, I, I want to say this. I'm trying to find the right thought because I you got me going on all these directions, oh, neurons, and I'm, I'm like, oh, I've been about this for hours. No, I love this. <laughs> but I think um, that maybe also we have to educate the leaders on what it means to work with veterans, right? So is that another form of advocacy for them by by educating them on you know, the the situation that veterans may be coming from and how those might be differing, you know, and how it's, because I, I do always go back to the Vietnam vets because I feel like they're not reaping the benefits of what their sacrifice demands, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so I'm thinking, how do we, when we have to educate leadership about them and so leadership would create a space for them and, and oh, that path, absolutely. right? Absolutely. I mean, and and even the example that I'll, you know, the case study that I'll dig into in October, you have to have, yes, you have to educate leadership. And then sometimes you have to have a little rebellious in you because that's how I was successful in my case study. I put the former military candidate in the qualified pool, even though the hiring manager didn't want him there. You see that? You all, you heard it right here. <laughs> I love I, it. I put, so by the day of the interview when we we're going over the resumes, because managers have a, 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 a habit of not looking over the resumes until right before the interview, you know, and then that's when the hiring manager saw that this person was ex-military. But the interesting thing about that situation was by far, no one could touch him. He was the best candidate. I love it. He was, he was the best candidate. And so I, when it comes to a hiring situation, you know, sometimes you have to, I'm willing to make the difficult and unpopular choices and take the hit for it. Mm -hmm. And I think that also factors into that professional equity. You know, if I'm going to go, if I'm going to go hard for something that I truly believe in uh, and that I think is right, I will advocate and advocate and advocate for it, you know, within reason. Until, you know, I just need to table it, you know, and really pick it up at another time. And so that hiring situation, that gentleman deserved to be in the candidate pool. And so I slipped him in the candidate pool. I love the rebellious streak in you, Dr. You know, so you got to be able to take the hit for it, too. And, not, and that's the thing. Not a lot of people are willing to take the hit for it, you know. Mm-hmm. And I understand. I understand because... Mm-hmm. 
people can treat you bad if they have authority on a job, if they don't like something that you do. That that situation kind of panned out, but that's how change happens. Mm-hmm. You know, change it has to be someone who authority. say, yeah, it, it, it requires someone to say, we need to look at this. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't even use the word of, it's not right because people have get tone deaf when you say it's not right. And I never use the word about fair because who cares about fair? No, right. I, I don't care about it. But I always say, we need to look at this, you know, and then I state the, state the reasons why. And then if you can't come back to me, whoever I'm talking to, to counteract the legitimate and irrational reasons why I say we need to look at that, then you just made my case. Wow. You know, you just made my case. And so that's how change happens. You know, so individuals have to be um, in the areas of diversity, diversity about any demographic. I don't care if you're talking about someone under 40, over 40, veteran, disabled, female, you know, it doesn't matter. Ex-military, you know, college graduates, millennials, because believe it or not, millennials are are discriminated against now just by being called a millennial. It's crazy. And so you need to be able to advocate when you see something is wrong that we really need to take a look at this. And I say to leaders, uh, because I work mostly with leaders, is this what we really want to do? Now that I've laid it out here, all the reasons why we need to take a look at it, is this something that we really want to do? Most people are not going to say, even if they felt like they didn't want to, they're not going to say out loud, well, we'll continue to do it this way. Right. Oh my They're God. Not. Dr. Fruden, you have taken me on a journey, one that I have very much enjoyed because what I gathered, if I could put our entire interview into a nutshell with regard to not only veterans, right? Because this was to discuss veterans, but it can be expanded to so many other groups, as you just stated. Yeah, because I also talk about retirees and the overqualified in my presentation. So it's the three gems to reach your diversity goals. Those are the three populations of individuals that get screened out of the talent acquisition process for a number of reasons that have nothing to do with qualifications, overqualified, retirees, and veterans. And we miss out, honestly, as a society and as businesses, of course, but as a society, I think we miss out on so much when we do that. But what I'm getting is that it's a two-pronged approach. So first you advocate for the person who's being, in this case, let's say the veteran who's being um, discriminated against in the workforce, but mm-hmm. then you educate the leader. So it's a top down and bottom up yes. uh, kind of, kind yes. of um, strategy, if you will. Yes, uh, because you don't want it to be a one-off situation. Mm-hmm. So, excuse me, that's where the education comes in. The education um, shows leadership, what the business reason is for you making the decision that changes needed to be made. Because I I threw, I throw my tasks and responsibilities in three buckets when it comes to what I do throughout a day's work. I'm there to make money, save money, or help the business achieve their organizational goals. And usually I can tie everything that I do into one of those three buckets. And so when I'm talking to leaders or hiring managers or anybody about something that's going on in the workplace that I say we need to look at, I tie it into our ability to make money, save money, or achieve organizational goals. And usually you can tie those into your strategic themes Mm -hmm. and say, this is counterproductive to what our strategic themes are, you know? And so, but yeah, talk money. You have to talk business. I happen to be a business manager who transitioned over to HR. And so I know how to speak the language you know, and I know how to get their attention. Um, that's and necessary to to honestly get change to occur. Absolutely, absolutely. Good change, because it's change for the organization and it's change that is going to happen repeatedly. And that's where the education comes in because they need to understand why it's good for the business so that they won't fall back on their old behavior. That makes perfect sense. And what I love is that this is something that's also... It's good for business, it's good for society, but it's also logical, sensible, and attainable. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So now we're about to wrap up, but I want to ask you, Dr. Pruden, what are two things that you'd like to impart upon our listeners? As if they didn't have enough gems to get from today, but... <laughs> um, I would say um, just 
strive to be self-aware. Mm. You know, I think we can resolve a lot of differences um, in society and the workplace by being self-aware of ourselves, our own biases, because we all have them. Mm-hmm. You know, when I meet someone and they say they don't have a bias, you know, I, my alarms go off because we all have biases. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think um, self-awareness is a good starting point to explore why we feel a certain way about certain things or a certain group of people. Um, and then maybe explore where those views originated from um, and seek to educate yourself as much as possible. I can, in closing, I'll give you a per- personal example that I use when I teach class about bias mm-hmm. that I found out about myself early in my career. I didn't realize that I had a bias against women not working. Oh, and I'll, no. and I'll tell you, and I'll tell you why. I was raised where the women in my family were educated. They were working, you know, even, you know, even the wives and mothers, they were, they still work. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have an example of a married woman sitting at home, not working and just being a mom. I had the example of married women still having a career. Mm -hmm. And so I thought what I saw was the norm. And so very early in my career, when I would meet a young mother who was just a mother and a wife, you know, I like, well, or went to college and not using a college degree. It was like, well, what'd you go to college for? What? I mean, you just doing nothing. You just sitting at home. And so it took me, I had to become more self-aware of why did I feel this way about these young ladies just being mothers or sitting at home doing nothing. That's their business. It didn't impact me in any particular way. And then I looked at where that originated from, because all of the examples I had of females in my life had careers and marriages and were mothers. But it could have been their option to sit home. They just chose not to do that. So I didn't have an example of someone who was a housewife. Right. No, I completely understand that. And so I viewed it as a waste. You know, I viewed it until I became self-aware and looked at where my bias originated from. And so I changed it because once I became aware of it, then I I was able to change it because I I realized I really was not that person. But I had to dig deep and figure out why do I why are you so concerned about what another woman does in her house? (laughs) Well, (laughs) I love it. And so we all have biases. And I use that as an example when I teach classes, when I tell people we all have biases. You need to be self-aware to figure out what your biases are and where they originated from and then realize, is that really you? Is that you now? And I no longer feel that way because I I figured out where that came from. Mm -hmm. Um, So self I would leave lead the listeners with um, try to be self-aware every day. Things are happening, ever-changing in society, and we are they're impacting us in certain ways. And sometimes how we were raised or what we've been exposed to impact how we interpret those things. And so when you get that mm feeling in you, just try to figure out where it comes from and just have a conversation, quiet conversation with yourself, you know, and sometimes you can help resolve it. Thank you, Dr. Pruden. Again, you've taken me down a journey because I I will admit to having had that same bias and I hadn't considered it truly until, I don't want to say till I became a parent myself, maybe slightly before then, because then I also, now I have a new appreciation for the stay-at-home mom mm-hmm. because I know I couldn't wait to get back to work. <laughs> so I was just like, wow, what they do is not even close to what I do. It both have value. Yes. But I remember thinking, I don't know how people do this with multiple yes. children. What is yes. happening? So I take my hat off to the woman that works in the office, the woman that works in the house. Um, I I just know, but that helped me because when you were saying um, self-awareness and self-education, what I took from that is that having those two things together leads to self-discovery. Right. Yes. That absolutely. Us absolutely. Are. And ch- and change. Yes. It leads to change. You yes. know. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Every change, I think, in every internal change, quite honestly, um, will help. Will benefit the world 
around us. I, at least this is my belief, right? Um, every positive internal change will help the world around us. Um, be that 10 people. Well, now it can't be more than 10 people because, you know, <laughs> <part. laughs> but, you know, be that 10 people or a million people virtually. So on that note, Dr. Pruden, I want to thank you so much for being a part of today's episode on the Global Fluency Podcast. And for our listeners out there, I want you to take away all of the gems that Dr. Pruden has shared with us today. And I want you to go back, listen to this uh, episode, and then go have those conversations um, that, that we encourage you to have on Global Fluency Podcast. Have those, you know, virtual water cooler conversations. Talk to your friends about this and, and let us know what you think. And take away from this today, professional equity. That's going to be my buzzword for a hot minute now. I love that. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Pugin. And take away self-awareness and self-education. So once again, Dr. Karen Hills Pruden, thank you for being a part of the Global Fluency Podcast today. Thank you for having me. It's been a blast. And I've had so much fun today, too much fun, but I'm taking it. <laughs> and so <laughs> for all of our speakers out there, we thank you for tuning in. Remember, this is your podcast. Let us know um, your comments, your thoughts, discussions that you want us to continue having. So please keep the conversation going. I'm your host, Bertine Crevacore West. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences. Leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going. Going.